Sure, I'm Hal Gaynor. I've been coming to MBO for almost 50 years, and uh, I currently work at the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. I was interested as a child in how things work, and so science was an obvious place to, to think about that. I started to think about engineering first, and nobody in my family was a scientist. In fact, nobody in my family had ever gone to college. Uh, in fact, when I think about it, my immediate family, no one finished high school. So uh, we really didn't have a background to determine uh, what science was about or what you could do with it and so on. It happens I may have had an aptitude in it because I went to this high school of science, uh, Stuyvesant High School in New York City, ultimately, in which was a science school. It was a science-oriented school. I didn't really focus that much on science uh, at the time. Uh, I was more interested, as I was in college, more interested in the arts and philosophy than I was in science. It happened that uh, as a result of having many kinds of jobs, as a steel worker, as a furry, as a paper hanger, and having, uh, um, as, as a young person, and having uh, uh, union cards in each of these categories, uh, I began to realize how hard it is to really work with your hands. And so I looked, thought about what will I do next, and it turns out it ha an opportunity came up to go to graduate school. This was after college to go to graduate school, obviously, in science, in a field called physiology, about which I knew very little. And I did that. And that's when I really became interested in science. So as a graduate student, I began to enjoy science. Uh, I began to think about its role in society. And I began to uh, uh, really consider myself a scientist. I don't think so, but on the other hand, what was definitive in my uh, career uh, was, uh, <clears throat> was when I went to be a postdoc in Harry Grunfest's lab. You may have heard of him. He was a very distinguished neurophysiologist who spent a lot of time. He's an icon here at Woods Hole and uh, the Marine Lab. And he... Um, uh, his laboratory at Columbia University, which I joined, uh, was uh, really instrumental in, in my development as a scientist. I saw there that there were scientists from all over the world that were working together. It was a rather large laboratory, and, uh, and, I, and, I, and I saw how much fun science was. So I came to the first of the MBL in 1960. And there, it was a complete surprise when I came. I went, as I just mentioned to you, I went to um, Harry Grunfuss' lab as a postdoc. I went in the fall sometime. And in the spring, when, and I began to learn a new field, because I was not in that field. My PhD was in biochemical work, and this was a whole new world for me, the neurophysiology. Uh, in, uh, in the spring, somewhere around May, I saw everybody in my lab was packing. And I asked, where are we going? Or oh, where should we be going? They said, Woods Hole, of course. And I said, where's Woods Hole? They said, well, every year, this lab, Harry's lab, picked up a hole. The whole lab picked up with all the equipment. There was a lot of equipment. And moved here, in fact, at that time, to the Lilly Building and set up a laboratory here in Woods Hole. So that was the first time I came to Woods Hole. I had never heard about it before. I just went with the flow. And the very first year, I was hooked. You know, all I remember, this is weird, but all I remember is the honeysuckle behind my dormitory. I lived in the wooden dormitory. Uh, right by, uh, <clears throat> across, and what it was across, sort of across from the fisheries, a little more up the block. And there was a powerful smell. Smells are supposed to be very memory trigger triggering. Well, there was a powerful smell of honeysuckle uh, at that time of the year that we were there. And, I, and, uh, and that had a big impact.
when I began, I was very active in the laboratory doing experiments. And as I say, we worked very, very hard. I and mean, I would come home three in the morning sometimes. So there was no, in Memorial Circle, there was no bus running at that time. So we'd have to walk from MBL to Memorial Circle in the evening. It was very nice in some ways. It was the first time I saw shooting stars because I, I would look up a very dark road and look up at the sky and there were the shooting stars. And uh, having come from New York, I never saw that before. So that was quite a shock. I mean, not a shock, a pleasure. Uh, so in the early days, I was driven by getting the experiments done. And we worked very, very hard, as I said. First of all, lobsters were a, um, a standard animal in which you could study inhibitory and excitatory synapses at the level of the muscle. Otherwise, you'd have to go into a spinal cord of an animal. But invertebrates, like the lobster, particularly the crustacea and the insects, but the crustacea were more feasible. Uh, so crayfish and lobsters is what we began to work on. And the original work, or the original motivation, was to be able to study excitatory and inhibitory synapses easily at the muscle. And that was mostly what I, mostly, not only, but mostly what I did while I was in Harry's lab. Well, now it's a whole different ball game, of course. Uh, at the time, it was all because it was so great. At the time, when I was a postdoc, it was such great science being done here. And in some ways, it's the same. It's great science is being done here. There's wonderful intellectual atmosphere. There are courses here. There are that at that time you could get into easily and, and listen to the lectures. Uh, now more difficult, except for selected ones. Um, there's evening seminars. In fact, I, there's one tonight that I'll be attending, giving an introduction in. And, uh, and, uh, and, and your family can enjoy this place too, because it's a place that our children grew up in the summer, and now they think it's their home more than where they were brought up for the other nine months of the year. In other words, they have more fondness to uh, Woods Hole than they did even where they lived in Maryland, which isn't a bad place. So, so it's a pretty remarkable place. It's something here for everybody. There's artists here. There are musicians. Um, there used to be, in the old days, a lot of more music at the MBO. Uh, but uh, now it's just once in a while concert. But uh, it used to be every Sunday night we had music in the MBO club. And it was usually a, a scientist who played an instrument very well. Amongst them was Bob Allen on the cello, and Khalil Adama on the flute. And these were class musicians. They were pretty impressive. Uh, and we would sit there in the MBO club without any air conditioning. But nevertheless, it was really fun. So it's an extraordinary place. Uh, it's a, it's a really a form of a lifestyle, one of which we have been very happy to partake of. Great. It was a great, just as I said, it's a great opportunity to be for the family to be together. Fortunately, my wife was a school teacher, so we could take those three months, or she could take those three months off two to three months, and, uh, and the kids had a great time. They were all what they call lifers in the science school for children, uh, which was a wonderful opportunity. They all went from being, including my granddaughter, have went from, from being the students there as well as assistants later on, selected to be. And all that was a wonderful experience for the kids. Well, I think it's, uh, as they say, it's a convening place. The uh, fact is, uh, as, as is often said, uh, uh, people from all over the world, scientists, I should say, from all over the world come with their families, of course, but come uh, to do science here and most of all to communicate with each other. So it's a, that's what I mean by convening place. It was a place for them to convene, that is us to convene, uh, and to communicate ideas and actually even do experiments together. Also, being so close to your home 
which is not rare in the real world outside, being close to your home, you could come in and go out as the experiments are needed. So there are these virtues uh, of the MBO which are really hard to match anywhere. Right? So the most valuable connections have been in the area of research that I did on the squid, which involved me, me studying something I would not normally have studied, neurofilament proteins. And then ultimately we discovered here that the neurofilament protein in squid was the first time any animal that had been found to have phosphorylation. We found, so we were very active in studying the phosphorylation of the neurofilament protein. That was done here. We published that, and then we and our colleagues each started a program in our home bases on that subject. Yeah. I had a colleague named Ray Lassick with whom I did the, much work here. We studied the question of whether axons synthesize proteins. To this day, we still think about it and work on it and write about it. In fact, I just wrote a paper this year that was published on this subject. So that's something that has been going on for many, many years. It's not entirely resolved. It's not a controversial issue. Uh, but last year, I met with another colleague here named Mike Titel, and we did a paper on, in a way, on an advanced part of the subject relating to subjects like exosomes, which is a vesicle that's secreted by cells, which has many functions, heat shock protein, which is a chaperone, which can actually correct many mistakes that cells make, and so on. So there are a lot of specific experiments that we have done here that led us to think more, and, and now in my current state, writing, mostly, uh, uh, writing about these subjects. I wanted to go back to Atoll to do some more work. And the uh, thing was that I was, by that time, in a, an institute which was not really supporting anybody coming to Woods Hole. That was the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. And so I search, searched out a, um, a scientist who goes to MB, went to MBL, who in fact was a icon at MBL. His name was Ichichi Tasaki. And Tasaki was a very famous neuro neurophysiologist, we call it at the time. And he was famous because he had, um, amongst many other things, he had discovered saltatory conduction, which was the conduction along myelinated nerves, which are very fast. That is, they conduct very quickly because of the ability to, uh, to bypass a lot of the axon in the action potential. And uh, so I went to Tasaki, and I made him an offer he couldn't refuse. I said, how about having me join your lab? This was, I believe, in 19, I think in 73, but I can't remember exactly. And I said, how about letting me join your lab, because I have this project that I'd like to do, and you're a critical person. So I joined his lab, but he made a deal. He said, uh, here's the deal. You can join my lab, but... Uh, you'll have to train my postdocs. <laughs> he was not into training postdocs, but he was into taking a few postdocs into his, they were almost all Japanese. And there he would disappear and I would be working with his postdocs. Okay? So that was actually quite interesting because it was a cultural interest with all these people who could hardly speak English uh, uh, and was, came to work with the sake and got stuck with me uh, for the summer. The reason he was unique was because he had a unique method that he developed here of perfusing the giant axon. You may have heard of others speak about perfusion because it was a very fundamental way to study the action potential in the giant axon. But the other people did it by the method of Hodgkin and Huxley. Namely, they took a giant axon, which is like a uh, uh, kind of almost like a toothpaste tube, and they squeezed out the axoplasm and then they had the one end cannulated and blew through perfusion solution, which was like an internal solution, a very simple internal solution, uh, largely potassium and so on. And, uh, and that would be their perfusion. I needed a different kind of perfusion, and it was the kind of perfusion that only Tasaki did, which was 
a very spectacular way of taking the axon, putting it on a, under a microscope, and then cutting a little sliver, a, a slit in one end, and a slit in the other end. He didn't squeeze anything. And he put these two tubes, little tubes, which were almost like micropipettes, that his wife blew, his wife made, made them, and she was unique too. And he actually had them go inside, one inside the other. And he blew out the axoplasm through these tubes, and then as he withdrew these two um, electrodes or, or micropipettes, he sent in protease solutions. Now the reason this was so special to me is that the tubes that he was moving in and out remained, and you could collect what was coming out of the axon in, uh, in drops of fluid that came through. And so my hypothesis, or at least my plan in this experiment with him, uh, was to actually introduce compounds that would label, bind to, and label, they actually were covalently labeling uh, um, proteins on the inner surface of the membrane and to see when we stimulated electrically what would come out. So we would do experiments in which we would essentially perfuse the axon, protease it so it would be clean on the inside surface. So now we have an, an inside surface that's completely clean, well, reasonably clean, and then actually label proteins from the inside and look to see what kind of proteins emerge upon very stimulation conditions. And that was a very successful experiment. It didn't resolve the question that I was after, which was to determine what proteins were important. In fact, I should say that the Saki was not a fan of the Hodgkin-Huxley model. He was not in favor of the idea of pores or channels. Or he had a whole different way of thinking about things. And the experiments I were doing were not inconsistent with that. So that worked out pretty well. But the fact of the matter is the proteins that we found come out, we were able to publish that material in some very good journals. <clears throat> so that was a very exciting experience here, and it take, making use of a collaborator who had really unique contributions, who was really normally sequestering himself quietly in a lab. He was one of these true scientific people that only thought about his experiments. I uh, was interested in, in the fact that if you took an isolated axon and you <clears throat> incorporate, uh, that is, incubated it in radioactive amino acids, you would discover, after a while, this axon had an enormous number of radioactive proteins. Namely, that system was actually producing new translation of protein. So that was discovered prior, a year, 10 years prior to my coming to do this work. And when I was uh, talking about this project that I wanted to do, somebody said to me, well, you know, you ought to talk to Ray Lassick, who's in the lab across the way, because he's doing the same, or he's asking the same questions. And so I said, oh, that's interesting. So I went and talked to Ray, and we hit it off very well, okay? And we decided to experiment together. And in subsequent summers, I moved from the Tosaki lab, and I'll come back to the Tosaki lab, but moved from the Tosaki lab over to share a lab with Ray, and we would work day and night on the question of where was this protein that's being made in the axon coming from. And to make a long story short, there were two hypotheses. One was that it was being made in the axon. The other one was that it was being made in the surrounding Schwann cells, the glia that surrounded the axon, and then transferred into the axoplasm. And in fact, in our work, we showed that it was primarily the glia that were making the proteins and transferring the axons. From that, we wrote a series of general cell biology papers, which was called the glial protein transfer hypothesis, which has stood till this day and really was a Woods Hole experiment on the squid. Well, it was a big difference between then and now. So when I f first, when I was younger and I first came to the MBL, the first thing I did was set up my lab, right? 
So we had to get the equipment together, whether we brought it up or we were storing it here. We had to put it all together. You had to get the tanks running so that they have seawater in them, put the squid in them, uh, and get started doing experiments. And we did experiments. We worked like dogs uh, during these months uh, and because it was so only three months and we wanted to get a lot done and in many ways we worked harder than we did back at home uh, because we had such a short time we wanted to have wanted to achieve something in that period in that short time so that was the first thing we did is get our lab together the, and pretty much simultaneously we were living in the early days in the cottages uh, in Memorial Circle and so we had to get that together. We had to get our lives together as well. So that's basically it. Oh, well, the MBL has changed a lot. Uh, it was a little more, it was much more chaotic and in a way more fun. On the other hand, it was always an economic trouble, maybe partly because of its chaotic, chaotic operation. There was always a commitment to science. I believe it's still true that there's a commitment to science. However, the MBL has become much more corporate. It's not really uh, more corporate, more bureaucratic. We had a much more intimate relationship with the administration than we used to. We were the administration. We were a corporation in which we um, made decisions, for better or worse, we made decisions uh, about what the policies were and so on. Now it's a, a very different situation, and I, uh, I mean, I think it's part of what's happening all through the country and all through all institutions in the country, including medical schools and and uh, colleges, universities, in which there's a tremendous administration, and percentage-wise, uh, they make all sorts of rules without consultation of the working people, namely the teachers and scientists. Okay. They sometimes consult, but not always. There's always a tension. There's always been tension between the administration and the working, working act, uh, scientists and people, but and the uh, institutions. But it's a little more now because the sense is that the si working scientists here do not have any more. In fact, they've given up. We've given up the corporation to the University of Chicago, which was a necessity. And I think the University of Chicago basically saved MBL, which would have gone bankrupt. But I think that um, it is still unclear uh, how the university start, how the University of Chicago will develop a governance plan that the scientists can participate in, because this is a transient population uh, that has come in the summer and some might not get a grant, not come, and so on. It's difficult to have such power in the hands of the transient population. So having stable power from the University of Chicago has its virtues. On the other hand, it takes away from the feeling of belonging and being a participant. So in that sense, there's a very big, a big change. And I think it's true throughout the society. We've become much more bureaucratic in our institutions. We've become much more... Uh, Corporate is the best word I can give for it. I love the interactions, I love the courses, I love the, the lectures, uh, I love the library where I work, uh, uh, my, felt, my colleagues who are still in the lab and those who are not in the lab are very close. It remains a place our children, we uh, always want to come every summer. Uh, I don't think they'd want to come to our place in Maryland every summer, <laughs> which is a horrible place to be in the summer, and because uh, it's so hot. But uh, uh, it's just a, uh, a wonderful experience overall. And we love coming. People who visit us say, oh my God, this is such a paradise. It's not just the fact that you're close by the sea and it's sort of beautiful. There are other beautiful places. There are other seashores and so on. But it's where you have everything. You have intellectualization, you have culture. It's a tremendous culture here. Uh, I mean, I think for the last three nights I've been at the Woods Hole Public Library listening to all sorts of wonderful performances, lectures, and so on. 
And that's not just at the library, it's all over the place. So uh, it's a very unique place. I, I can't think of another place in the world that has these characteristics.